This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Ed and I am honored to be with you this Sunday after Easter. You notice the crowds are not here? (laughs) For 15 years of my ministry, I was an associate pastor. For 15 years of my ministry, I never preached on Easter. But every single Sunday after Easter, I always got it. The Lutherans actually call this Low Sunday. So I'm glad you're here to celebrate Low Sunday because you are the faithful, gathering at the tomb again to make sure it's still empty, uh, rejoicing in the good news and being faithful. And today's texts are all about that. So thank you for that. Announcements. What do we have here? Going too fast for me. There we go. (laughs) Let's start with Wednesday dinners. Uh, Salad bar, Swedish meatballs, better than Ikea. So this is where you want to be, right here, okay? We have that, of course, our Wednesday night activities. We have things for children and youth, uh, Bible study, uh, pickleball choir, and a group called What Does It Mean to Be Reconciling, which meets in the uh, chapel. Um, Just doing working on current issues, not just the reconciling issue. Spring cleaning is coming up at our house. You can come to Carver. Wait, that's not it. (laughs) Spring cleaning here at church is May 4th, 9 to noon. Uh, There'll be more announcements about that, but maybe you can put that on your calendar. And the garage sale, May 22 to May 24. Um, A big deal. And I've been in a lot of churches. I've seen a lot of garage sales. I have never, ever seen a church do garage sales as well as this one does. Yeah, there we go. Thank you to those who work on it. Um, Usually it means the entire church is going to be filled with stuff for like three weeks, and it doesn't work that way. Everything's organized and and well done, and and just, it's amazing. So thank you to the many volunteers who make that happen, and you can be planning on what you can donate in advance. What else do we have? Oh, I want to mention, uh, Don Dibley is playing the organ today. And I've heard, yeah, I've heard many times that she's an organist, but I've never heard her play till today, and I'm already impressed. So can we, (laughs) so thank you, Don, for that. Please rise as you are able. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations.
You may be seated. Our opening prayer. Hi, my name is Dave Osborne. I'll be bringing the opening prayer this morning. Please pray with me. Generous God, as we gather to offer our tithes and offerings, we are reminded that your son, after his death and resurrection, sent followers into the world to proclaim his resurrection to the entire world. Just as your word brings light into our lives, may our giving be an act of generosity and a reflection of the abundance of your love. May we steward these gifts wisely for the betterment of your kingdom. We thank you for the forgiveness and grace offered through Jesus. Send us also into the world to bear witness to all you have done in our lives. This we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Lord God, we offer to you what you first gave to us. We offer ourselves, our time, and our possessions signs of your gracious love. Amen. You may be seated. I feel blessed to be with you this morning. I now know you guys. I now feel at home here. I like some of you. <laughs> no, it's truly a blessing. It's, it's what church is about. It's not about Christmas and Easter. It's about the faithful. It's about being together, praying together, worshiping together, studying together, hearing the scriptures together, supporting and helping one another. We are blessed. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the many blessings you showered upon us. We give you thanks for the beautiful Easter we celebrated and for the many good people who were here, Lord. We know they don't come every Sunday, but we pray for them. We know that they are a different kind of faithful. Bless them, Lord. Watch over them. Bring them back when it's needed. And be with us, Lord, the faithful who gather Sunday after Sunday to hear your word, to sing your praises, and to lift up our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we give you thanks for your church and the many forms it takes. We give you thanks for the well and its long and faithful history in this community. We give thanks that you've watched over us and pray that you are going to continue to watch over us and be with Pastor Chad and his family as they begin their time here. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we lift up the things we are concerned about. We give thanks for the rain that came today, giving thanks for, for rain in due season and the beauty it brings. We give thanks for the many blessings of living in a country where we are so free to worship. But Lord, we remember there are so many people who are not as blessed as we are. Open up our hearts to them, open up our hands to them, that we can care for them, love them, and serve them, just as you have served and loved us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And Lord, we pray for a troubled world. We pray for those, wherever they might be, here or abroad, who suffer from violence, terrorism, killings. We pray for people who are at war, for Palestine and Israel for Ukraine and Russia, for Yemen and Haiti. Be with these people, Lord, and bring peace. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. You have a prayer request this morning? Please let me know. We just pray um, next weekend, um, the Unidos and Cristo uh, people will be here. And then uh, pray that um, we would accept... Uh, the inconvenience of having them taking over the building for three days and uh, pray for the people that will be attending. This is a spiritual retreat that we are happy to be a part of, and they'll be here next weekend, and they helped us with the Good Friday service and in so many ways. So we give thanks for their presence. Lord, in your mercy. I would like prayers for my nephew, Alex, who has to have surgery for cancer on April 16th. His dad, who is still struggling with brain cancer, his name is Tim, and then my sister, who has taken everybody back and forth to their appointments and trying to take care of everybody. Well, we pray for Alex and for Tim and for your sister, Jeanette, and that they would be made well, that they would be strengthened in all that they do. Lord, in your mercy. Please pray for my sister, Diane. She has been diagnosed as having, uh, okay, uh, oh dear, <laughs> um, the shaking um, Parkinson's disease. Uh, she's taking some medication, but it it's helping some, but it needs to be increased, so we'll help her more. 
So pray for the the caregivers and the people in the nursing home, which yeah. we visited a couple of weeks ago, which seemed to be uh, very uh, a nice place to be. We pray for your sister, her caregivers, and for all who wrestle with this disease. Lord, in your mercy. We would like prayer for my niece passed away this last Tuesday, and her husband, Jonathan, would like prayer for Jonathan and the four children that they get through this quickly and have comfort and peace. We pray for Jonathan and his family at the passing of your niece. May they be comforted by the promise of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we give you thanks for having heard these prayers and for those whom we mentioned before you silently in our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. we'll say the Lord's Prayer as part of our communion liturgy today. Please rise as you are able for our hymn of promise. seated. We make a transition today. For many weeks we've been in Mark's gospel, from the baptism of Jesus through his ministry, his healings, and his teachings, to his journey to Jerusalem, his marching into the city, his, I'll say, conversation with those in the temple, and all the way to Good Friday and the seeming failure, the seeming loss, to be turned around at Easter. We did all of that in Mark's gospel, and it was amazing to me. I've done that many times before, but I got more out of it this time. But now we make a transition to part two. 
We're moving into the book of Acts, which is a sequel. You know about sequels from movies, right? It's not a sequel to Mark. It's a sequel to Luke's gospel. And he's going to actually tell us that. This is my second book. I did the first book. Now I want you to hear about the second book. And in this book, he's going to tell us the history of the early church. Now, one of the fun things we could do in Bible study is to go through Matthew's gospel, where he has a lot of this history of the early church at the time of Jesus. He kind of works it into the text. He didn't think to write a sequel, or he wouldn't have to do that. But here we have this sequel, and it starts after the resurrection. And it's an important book to tell us about how the church gets started, about the beginning of Paul's ministry and a lot of important things. And he addresses Luke, we don't know his name, but Luke's the guest, Luke the physician. In the gospel, Luke addresses it to O Theophilus, Theo meaning God, Philos meaning to love, to the one who loves God. It could have been somebody named Theophilus, maybe he's writing it for a patron, Let me tell you the story. Or maybe he's writing to everyone who loves God to hear the story. We're not sure. The second one makes a little more sense, doesn't it? So now we start in the second book, and let's see what he has to say. Theophilus, in the first scroll, I wrote concerning everything Jesus did and taught from the beginning. Give you a little reminder. This is what we did in the first scroll right up to the day when he was taken up into heaven. Before he was taken up, working in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus instructed the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed them that he was still alive with many convincing proofs. Now, the convincing proofs, there's a number of them in the scriptures, especially in John's gospel. And there's Thomas, remember? This is often the Doubting Thomas Sunday. I preached on it many times. I won't believe unless I can touch and see. And then John concludes that story with, blessed are the people who have not seen Jesus and still believe. Who's that? Who's not seen Jesus and still believes? We do. We are the blessed ones. And John also makes a point of Jesus eating fish for breakfast with the disciples. Because A lot of talk about, well, a spirit couldn't eat real food. A spirit couldn't be that physical. But the proofs, the various proofs that Jesus has shown that he is a living body. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. Why is that number 40 important? It's symbolic, isn't it? Um, The the Israelites were in a symbolic period in the wilderness for 40 years. And if I start talking about that, we'll be here all day, but it's one of my favorite stories. (laughs) As a kid, I thought they were in the world's biggest desert, and it took 40 years to get from that end to this end. (laughs) It's the Sinai Desert. You can walk it in three or four days easily. They know the way across the desert. They're just afraid to go. That's a whole other story. But they're out there for 40 years. And then Jesus, after he's baptized, goes into the wilderness. Not wilderness like Minnesota, not beautiful northern Minnesota wilderness, but into that place where you die because there's no water, there's no shade, there's just rocks and sand and death. And after 40 days, he's still alive. And now Jesus is with the disciples and teaching them and talking to them for 40 days. It's symbolic. It means the full time needed. The full time in the Sinai desert, the full time in the wilderness, the full time with the disciples. He's there for a while. While they were eating together, Jesus ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. What has the Father promised? The giving of the Holy Spirit. He said, this is what you heard from me. John baptized with water, but in only a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? 
See, this is the misconception. God sent his son to do these miracles. God sent his son with this amazing teaching to restore Israel the way it used to be with David. Give us our country back. Give us our freedom and our independence back. But Jesus never does that, does he? And he doesn't correct them, which I think is interesting. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus replied, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has sent by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's a very famous verse. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has sent. You following the news about the eclipse? Have you seen some Christians think this is it? <laughs> this eclipse was literally predicted by scientists over 300 years ago. So maybe this is it, but I'm guessing not. There have been a lot of eclipses through time. It'll be magnificent and cool, I'm sure. But it's not it. It's not the time. We don't know the time, do we? We've already talked about that. And that's what today's scripture is going to be getting at. So, rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where it all starts, right there, right? In all Judea. Now, Judea in the Old Testament is the southern part of Israel. And then to Samaria. We kind of call that middle Israel. And we've talked before at great length how Samaritans and Jews don't get along in the long history there. And then where? To the ends of the earth. This verse 8 is quoted by many people to encourage us to be witnesses all around the world. To take the gospel from the beginning place to the end. And it's what happens in the book of Acts. It starts in Jerusalem, it goes to Judea, then it goes to Samaria, then it goes to Rome. This book ends with Paul arrested in Rome, about to be executed, but the gospel has made it that far. And if you've made it to Rome, you've made it everywhere, right? That's the big city. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took them out of his sight out of their sight. I was going to bring some artwork for this. There's some really funny paintings of the disciples doing this and two little feet at the top of the painting. <laughs> there he goes. I didn't think that was necessary. While he was going away and as they were staring toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans. Galileans, really? Not faithful followers of Jesus? But you guys that live up north and came down south to do all this stuff? <laughs> Identified where they're from? Oh, you Minnesotans. <laughs> oh, you Texans. Oh, you Wisconsinites, whatever it is. Oh, you Galileans. Why are you standing here looking toward heaven? Well, I've got an answer for that. Because Jesus was just here and he went like this. <laughs> and we're all staring to see what's going to happen next. If only I had my cell phone with me, I could have gotten some great video of this. <laughs> of course I'm standing here staring into heaven. It makes perfect sense to me. Why are you standing here toward, looking toward heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. So if Jesus is going to return in the same way we saw him disappear, that means he's going to float down at the time of the eclipse or float down at the year 2000 or float down at whatever point in history you think is going to happen. But the point here is you're not going to miss it. It's going to be so dramatic. You don't have to worry about standing here and staring. It's going to happen and you'll see it when it happens. Don't worry about that. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. What does that mean? On the Sabbath, Jewish people don't work. And what's considered work? Well, a good long hike is considered work. 
Walking around your house is not considered work. Walking to your neighbor's house is not considered work. How about if I walk to the grocery store? It depends. How far away is it? <laughs> they said, different rabbis said, between 1,000 and 2,000 cubits. That's just from your elbow to the tip of your fingers. Now, if we were to take a measurement here, mine's longer. <laughs> it's a pretty indirect way of measuring things. But the point was, you can't go much farther than that. One rabbi said, you can walk 1,000 cubits. Unless you've got a dog, then you can walk 2,000 cubits. <laughs> he said, didn't say a dog, he said animals. <laughs> but you can go farther if you're caring for the animals. That's as far as you can go. I had a wonderful professor when I was in Jerusalem, a Jewish professor, and he taught a class on Friday afternoons for us. And as he was talking, he'd be walking around, and he'd always go over to the window, and he'd look to see how much sunlight he had left, because he had to get home before the sun went down. Otherwise, he had to spend the night with us, and he didn't want to do that, obviously. So, <laughs> But he'd just keep an eye on, how can I get home before it starts? So, the Mount of Olives is about a Sabbath day's journey away. When they entered the city, they went to the upstairs room. Remember, we saw the upper room before, where they were staying. And then they list the disciples. Now, the disciples are listed. How many of them are there? Twelve. There's 11 at this point. Thank you, Janet. There were 12 to start with. Oddly enough, the, the Gospels don't always agree on the list. Well, a person could have more than one name. That could explain a lot of it. Could be nicknames. We don't know. Could be a bad memory. We don't know what it is. But here's the list they have here. And it starts with the same four they always start with. Peter, James, John, and Andrew. These are the four kind of at the heart of it. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, Alphaeus' son, Simon the Zealot. What's a zealot? When we say someone is zealous, it means they're really committed to their faith. Maybe Simon was really committed to his faith, but it can also be a political title because there were a group of people at the time of Jesus, zealots, who were all about kicking Rome out of their country and reclaiming political power. Maybe he's one of them. I don't know. Simon the zealot and Judas. Wait a minute. Judas betrayed Jesus. and We find out he hangs himself. How's he in this list? Because there's more than one Judas in the disciples. This Judas is James' son, not to be confused with the other Judas. Apparently, Judas was actually a very common name, and there are people who think that Jesus' real name was actually Judas. <laughs> that would confuse the whole body. Just don't go there from the New Testament. We'll just keep the way it is. But it's, a, it's this other guy, and there's only 11 of them because the Judas Iscariot is not there. Now, there's, I, I do a sermon on Judas. Maybe we'll come back to that sometime. And all were united in their devotion to prayer. That's what they're doing now. They're praying together. Along with some women. Luke mentions more women by name in the Gospel of Luke than all the other Gospels combined. Luke's all about the women who follow Jesus. Including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Jesus had brothers? Was Jesus an only child? Oh, my goodness. We've just opened up a can of worms. Let's take a look. From Mark chapter 6, verse 3. I'll start in one. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all this? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son? Yes. The brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And aren't his sisters here with us too? How many sisters? It's two at least, right? Or at least six kids. Plus Jesus. 
Is Jesus the oldest of seven? The Catholic Church is not having that. This is not fitting with their theology. They explain this verse. Well, those aren't Mary's kids, obviously, and I'll come back to why. Those are Joseph's kids from his first marriage. See, the Catholic Church has put a lot of emphasis on Mary, and Mariology, the study of Mary, is at the center of Catholic theology, and I'm not criticizing it, I'm not making fun of it. I don't understand it. There's a lot of things I don't understand. And they talk about Mary in godly terms, and we all know the story of the virgin birth, right? But that's one of the doctrines, the virgin birth of Jesus. The other doctrine is the immaculate conception. And a lot of people, pastors and lay people alike, refer to the immaculate conception to the way Jesus was born. The Immaculate Conception, oddly enough, has nothing to do with Jesus' birth. The Immaculate Conception is how Mary was conceived. I don't know what that means. It wasn't a virgin birth, but it was immaculate somehow. Because she couldn't have any original sin in her. The Catholic Church says we get original sin from our parents. It's passed down through us genetically. But Mary who's going to be the vessel that the Son of God is going to pass through, can't be sinful. Her conception was different from everybody else. Hers was immaculate without passing on original sin. So we have the virgin birth, the immaculate conception, and then interestingly enough, oh, the perpetual virginity of Mary is the other Catholic teaching. So she couldn't have had six more kids. (laughs) She's perpetually forever a virgin. And the fourth one, the assumption of Mary into heaven. Not in the Bible, but the Catholic Church teaches us that, the, that Mary was physically lifted up into heaven the same way Jesus was. Catholic churches to this day have assumption of Mary Sunday to celebrate that. Now, a lot of those things aren't in Scripture, and I'm not criticizing the Catholic Church. They have a different authority. Tradition. We know this is true because we've believed it for over 1,500 years. God wouldn't let us believe the wrong thing for that long. This is in our tradition. Some of their traditions go back to the time of the first Christians. Peter was the first pope, and they can trace every single pope since him through the line of, uh, of, what is that word, of succession. Thank you. So they have this different standard of tradition, which is fine. I I say Methodists would do the same thing, except we don't have that many traditions. True, isn't it? If you go to Assisi, Italy, you can see the baptismal font in the church that St. Francis was baptized with five or six hundred years ago. And you imagine being in Assisi and saying, I want my kid baptized in that one to follow this great tradition. If we had 600-year-old baptismal fonts, we'd have traditions too. (laughs) We just don't have that. We're too young as a denomination. Okay, I digress. But this, just the reference of Mary, the mother of Jesus, just raises all these questions and his brothers. In Mark's gospel, in the beginning, when Jesus is teaching and he's in a house full of people, they tell him, your mother and your brothers are here. They think he's gone crazy. Well, now here's Mary in the upper room with the disciples, maybe, and the brothers reconciled to the whole idea. That's not even the sermon. (laughs) Grace to you and peace from God who is our Father. Amen. When I was in seminary, I was taught how to preach. And they said every sermon has to have three parts. Three points to a sermon. And when I was Lutheran, confirmation students had to come at least 10 times a year and take notes on the sermon. And under a sermon, I have one, two, and three. And one young person wrote, there were no points today. (laughs) In other words, this sermon was pointless. (laughs) 
and it might have been. But the three points are pretty easy to, re to recognize. What happened? That's the first point. What, in this, what is this story telling us about? And we've looked at Jesus' miracles. We looked at his teachings. We looked at his traveling around, his calling of the disciples. What happened? We need to know that. What? And then, so what? Why is that important, what happened? Was that out of the ordinary at that time? Was that against the normal culture? Was that the normal way they did things? Is there any evidence that it happened? What, so what, and the most important one that I'm not very good at, now what? And that's what this text is doing for us today. We came here and celebrated Easter with all of our heart and soul and mind, didn't we? We put everything into it, and it was great. That's happened. And that's amazing because life is stronger than death. Jesus came back from the dead. We don't have to explain why that's important. But the important question for me is, now what? What do the disciples do? They go back to the upper room and pray. I pray, briefly. When I was in Columbia Heights, we shared our building with a congregation from Ghana, Africa. And they had a senior pastor who they called the prophet. Can you call me the prophet just for one week? <laughs> <laughs> and three associate pastors, and I, I was visiting with them, and they were just wonderful, wonderful young people. And, and they said, oh yeah, the, the, the prophet has called us to prayer this week. And they met like at 10 o'clock at night. And they would pray till two or three in the morning. I said, invite me. I'll be there for the first half hour, and then I'll be the guy sleeping in the corner. <laughs> That's a different way to pray, isn't it, for five hours. I'm not criticizing it. I admire it. I just can't do it. So if I can't do that, now what am I supposed to be doing? Now what? I believe in the resurrection. I believe that Jesus came back from the dead. I believe that he ascended up into heaven. I believe he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, what am I going to do with that? How is it going to change me? How is it going to change my everyday life? Because it would be fine to stop there and just say, that's what we believe and that's fine and that's all good. But the question is really much more important is how does that change you? What do you do now? The church has answered, haven't they? We gather in worship. We pray for one another. We help one another. We serve those who are needy. We work for peace. We try to make a difference. What, so what, and now what? Where are we now, 2,000 years later? Grace to you in peace. Amen. The service continues with the celebration of Holy Communion. One of the reasons I love being, and communion volunteers, you can come forward now. One of the reasons I love serving in the Methodist Church, as opposed to the Lutheran Church, There's different theologies of communion, and I won't go into that now. But in the Lutheran church, I would say all those who believe in Christ are welcome to come to the Lord's table. I literally can't say that in the Methodist church. It's against the rules. <laughs> I say all are welcome. Everyone is welcome. Adult, child, infants. People who believe, people who don't believe. One of my memorable communion experiences, when I was at Good Sam and Edina, we had a Muslim man come to worship with us, and he came up for communion. So I couldn't have communed him in a Lutheran church. I would have said, I'm sorry, you're excommunicated. You're out of the, the communion, the community. But in the Methodist church, I could say, you are welcome here. And I really like that about that. So, come to the Lord's table, all you who love him. Come to the Lord's table, confess your sin. Come to the Lord's table and be at peace. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right, right to praise you, Lord. It is a right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, holy triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. From the rising of the sun to its setting, your name is praised among all peoples. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with your people on earth and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed Lord, in remembrance of all you've done to save us, we offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice and union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Now we remember our Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup also and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And hear us now as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts of God have been prepared for the people of God. Please come as you are prepared to the front to receive Holy Communion.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, who is Jesus the Christ, strengthen us and keep us in his grace now and forever. Amen. Please rise as you are able. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I do write these, I just don't always remember what I wrote. <laughs> Together, bless us that we can be a blessing to the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.